So yes, thank you and welcome to our, to our program for this evening. Um, this is uh, part of our distinguished, excuse me, uh, the, uh, my mind just went blank here. Great decisions. <laughs> Great decisions. Great decisions. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so uh, Dr. Tommy Shi is an uh, associate professor uh, in business at Lund University He's a policy expert there. Uh, his research focuses on global science and geopolitics and on innovation management. He's a senior advisor at the Swedish Foundation for International Cooperation in Research and Higher Education. At this organization, he oversees the work on responsible internationalization, including coordinating the Global Alliance for Responsible Internationalization. It is a network of consisting of research funding agencies from five different continents. Uh, Tommy also serves as an expert on science and technology and business for the European Commission and the Swedish government agencies. So, Tommy, we thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, maybe we could start with a little bit of overview. Um, you know, how did you get interested in this, this topic? Uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, happy to uh, talk about this. Uh, so, so basically, how I got started was... Um, um coming from the university of course i've been working a lot with uh, scientists and researchers across the world and then it's a big part of it it, it is actually trying to disseminate knowledge and um, uh, but also for the past few years it has been obvious that the world is changing i mean we still see a <laughs> I would see quite active globalization, but it is changing because of uh, increased security concerns in the world. Um, so I was basically recruited to uh, a policy organization to kind of try to create a little more knowledge around this issue in um, in Sweden. So that's basically where it started, and and um, I uh, something that started just as a project has turned into. Something much more uh, has because uh, it, it hasn't really kind of gotten any better. It's uh, unfortunately things are getting worse. Um, so so the issue is here to stay. Uh, but that that's kind of the short story as to how I got started. Ray, I think you are muted. You're on mute, Ray. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, maybe you could give us a little background on how this all fits together and, you know, what, how, how people like you view this science across borders. Yeah, the, I have uh, three slides, uh, which I'd like to show just to kind of give a, a short introduction to, of course, this is a very, very big topic and it's very difficult to cover just in, in three slides, but I'll, I'll try and do my best there and just... Uh, try to explain what I mean. Let's see, share my screen here and uh, I hope that you can see my slides. Yep, looks good. Okay, so uh, so I'll just start with this one here and, 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 and why do scientists work across borders? And the simple question here is, is, is basically that uh, as a researcher, you, you, you're kind of driven by uh, you, you want to advance knowledge and for that you need data of course uh, of course you want to work with competent people uh, students and um, it's, it's also a lot of it is about basically just getting to know people and, and see what's out there um, and uh, when you start to see what's out there finding uh, people that are equally willing to collaborate that's kind of where uh, co-creation can start right and and that it, it is um, evident that that raises quality in the research also of course impact because uh, if you're only doing research with within a university or one country of course the impact of that will be limited to that country right I mean of course others can read about it but uh, really how value is, is, is being created, how knowledge is being used is, is by actually interacting. So uh, the more you interact across border uh, borders, the more, of course, uh, 
uh, more value will be created. And and um, universities also, independent of any country, you know, are are kind of used to this way of working. It is very open. It's a very open uh, sector. Uh, and this, of course, becomes increasingly important now also due to the uh, global challenges and um, all these adverse effects coming after in the wake of you know climate change and um, pandemics etc so so the the reasons why we work across borders as scientists is, is quite easy um uh, but then if we then get to how is this governed then how does this work uh, so what i'm trying to show here is just a network of researchers so basically the dots here they're the nodes these are people and this is usually how a network will look like. So we're talking about researchers that will uh, form collaborations with people they find suitable to work with, that have uh, uh, competencies that are uh, uh, somehow needed in order to advance a project and uh, uh, project goals. Now, obviously these people are going to work in different organizations. So um, the uh, kind of dotted line there kind of represents that they're actually working within an organization, uh, but they're also working within a nation. Uh, so this is just kind of one organization that I've shown there in one country. But of course, the other dots, they will also be encircled by these organizations and countries. But since... Um, as a scientist, you often work in a very open environment. It's it's more it's viewed often as a more porous line. So it, it's kind of not a, a, a static line, which will kind of like restrict you from kind of working only within that uh, organization or country. Uh, companies, of course, is, is different because companies, they, they will be much more restrictive in how resources and knowledge can be shared. But that's not how it works in science. So this is often what we call a scientific globalism perspective that will try to advance knowledge as best as we can in an open fashion. Right? And um, the, the lines are very porous here. Uh, and this also aligns very well with this idea of uh, science as a common good rather than as something belonging to a nation or uh, to uh, an organization. So the next picture here is seeing it then when these lines have now all of a sudden become much, much more uh, stricter. Right? So what we're seeing now is that we clearly see how these researchers are organized within organizations and within countries. Um, and and this perspective, uh, these perspectives have always been here, right? I mean, it, it's it's uh, scientists have always been uh, employed by universities that's mainly funded by nations. But states, uh, governments have usually respected institutional autonomy, respected academic freedom, to let researchers find their partners wherever they find, in any ways they find suitable, you know, even in countries that are very different from our own country. Uh, and this is changing now, of course, because of geopolitics. It is changing because we have countries that are, let's say, very different in terms of values when it comes to political systems and uh, uh, how you view uh, human interaction and those kind of things, right? So, so these lines now are becoming clear. You, there's more to protect, not only resources, uh, but also there are issues concerning national security, about maintaining hegemonic power, and all those kind of things. So this is what we would call a scientific nationalism perspective. Uh, so today, basically, the clashes between these two perspectives are very, very visible. So science across borders now uh, is, I would say, it's increasing every year and it's still increasing. But 
the problem today is that it is being controlled in a much tougher way today than it was just five, 10 years ago. Um, and this is, from a scientist's perspective, very problematic because how are we then going to deal with advancing knowledge? How are we going to find solutions to global challenges, et cetera? So this is now a, uh, I wouldn't call it a dilemma, but it's definitely a lot more conflict and it's uh, definitely a lot more difficult than to kind of achieve a lot of things uh, given the situation. So I would like to stop here and just uh, maybe we should go back and have a discussion. Sure. Okay. All right, thank you for giving us that perspective on that. Um, the, the article in our Great Decisions book, this, this particular, for this topic, focused primarily on climate change. Um, what, what are some of the other areas of cross-border science that are kind of like important today that are is receiving the most attention? Uh, yeah, there are several areas. I would say, of course, climate change, the obvious one, but also about also global health. I mean, we can definitely see how uh, virus and bacteria don't respect borders, right? And um, I, I would say definitely that uh, this is uh, uh, the 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 one of the most important areas to work together uh, when it comes to global health, that if we're not going to be able to share data, to be able to work with other scientists, it's very difficult to know the origins or the mechanisms of, of certain diseases and how a virus will spread and those kind of things. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing would be, for example, biodiversity. Um, that's also species. Uh, we're talking both about uh, animals and uh, also plants and those kind of things. Doesn't respect uh, borders either, right? So how are you going to preserve uh, habitats and uh, animals and uh, different species if, if we are not able to work across borders? So those are just two other areas which are going to be very important biodiversity climate change uh, global health those are all very important okay thank you uh, just as a reminder if uh, you have a question uh, if you go to the chat room and uh, send your questions directly to me I'll, when we get done with this first part of the program uh, i will call on you to ask your question uh, later on um one of the one of the issues that was again mentioned in the uh, in the article was about the idea of moral hazard. Um, how does how do scientists view this notion of moral hazard? You know, especially as it relates to kind of cross border kind of impacts of these different uh, areas. Uh, yeah, moral hazard. I mean, that's a term that's often being associated with economics, and uh, that. Basically, someone is willing to take on more risks than it's warranted because you don't have to bear the consequences. So that, that would be when banks are being bailed out, but because they've been taking too much risk and, and, and taxpayers need to cover for the banks, for example. In science, that could mean different things. Uh, I think in the article, it refers to... Um, that certain actors in society will not take responsibility for, uh, for example, now in, 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 the, in the article that I read, I think it, it was talking basically about that, do you want to develop something that you don't, we don't really know how effective it will be, uh, but it will be somehow portrayed as something that could save the world, but we don't really know that yet. Uh, and and if we do it like that, if that's going to happen, then, then certain actors will continue to pollute, think that, well, there will be a solution in the future. So we might as well just continue as usual. 
Uh, from a scientist perspective, though, more has to could mean that another thing, and that's, for example, well, let's go to Africa. Because what do we have in Africa? Well, a lot of diseases, uh, for example, malaria, uh, which we don't really find in more developed parts of the world. And uh, we could go there and try out things. And, and, and the criticism here, of course, uh, it's a valid criticism, is that people will, researchers from the West, will go there, try things, and then go back. And don't really sometimes think more about what will happen to these people. Because um, as a scientist, I don't think that scientists usually mean to do any evil. That That's not, but sometimes it's difficult to kind of put yourself in the situation thinking about, well, what could, ha what will happen? What are the contextual factors? Why are these people willing or not willing to do this? Uh, it's very easy from a scientist perspective thinking about, well, if I do this, this will benefit uh, these populations, vulnerable populations later on. Uh, but also often what happens is that you go there and then you leave and we don't know what happens with these people. So that, that's kind of moral hazard also from more kind of scientific perspective, I mean, uh, doing conducting actual research. So that's a little different from how it's described in the article. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's interesting because, you know, we we don't really think too much. I, I think about it, the way scientists kind of view the the impact of their work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you saw the uh, movie Oppenheimer, of course, after the bomb was developed, uh, Oppenheimer had, you know, this sort of, come to Jesus moment about you know, understanding what he had done. So that, that's kind of an interesting, mm -hmm. kind of the ultimate moral hazard there. Huh? Um, one other area you didn't mention, which I, I think is kind of interesting, is uh, venturing into space. It seems like every country today that has any kind of uh, substantial resource base is trying to get to the moon or sending up satellites and so forth. Uh, are space scientists cooperating with each other or, or has this become such a national uh, competition that uh, the space scientists don't really cooperate much. Uh, I'm, I'm not a specialist in uh, space science, but uh, what I do know is, is that, I mean, space science has always been kind of part of uh, uh, national security programs. You know, it, it, it's a lot of defense research connected to that. So, I, I would say that it's all space research has always been kind of like part of an arms race. So, uh, so I, I think it's it's always somehow been more restricted in how who you can work with, what which countries can work together. Um, of course, it is. I think also a space for. I mean, space being a space for. Uh, I, I I think. Uh, an arena for building diplomatic relations. I mean, we, we see that uh, uh, with these international space shuttles and, and, and those kind of things, right? But but uh, when it comes to basic research and uh, the area itself, I think it's extremely, well, countries are extremely cautious and protective uh, of uh, this type of research. So, so I, I, th I don't think it's ever been that open. But then, you know, all, all these fields are also made up of underlying fields like mathematics, physics, um, materials engineering, and those kind of things that, you know, there you often see a lot of collaboration. And, and then somehow they, you know, there, there, there is an interconnectedness there. Um, so, so something can lead to development within research coming from these more auxiliary um, areas, of course. But space research, if you label it like that, I think that has never been that open. Okay, are you frozen up there? Are you okay? Oh, you're okay. I'm oh, sorry. Um, so I kind of maybe circle back to uh, the issue of ethics a little bit and this kind of an extension of moral hazard. Uh, we know that many private companies, mining companies, energy companies, oil companies employ a lot of scientists. Um, this 
Corporate sci scientists share data and uh, participate in international dialogue on, on these issues. Uh, you know, one of the things I remember is that the tobacco industry for many years uh, hid uh, data on the hazards of smoking. And uh, they, I mean, these were presumed reputable, reputable scientists who were conducting this research, but yet they weren't sharing that that kind of data. So how, how is the difference between sort of the public sector scientists versus these private scientists? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, the, the, how research is conducted at uh, corporations, for-profit corporations and, and universities are obviously very, very different. Uh, I mean, remember show, showing these two pictures. If we, the latter picture that I showed with these very, you know, strict thick lines that's basically how a company works right i mean it's uh companies are there to make money uh the research or what they invest in is supposed to somehow create value for the company um and uh so, so it, it is definitely much much more controlled um research is often hidden or it's being not openly uh uh available so people usually researchers within companies are uh usually do not publish they will rather try to take a patent get a patent on 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 the the discoveries first um and these uh um patents then are used for various things uh, i mean like japanese companies are quite known for for example using um patents in in a protective way so that's kind of like if i have a patent it means that someone else cannot do this right and uh, that that's used kind of like more for defensive purposes can also of course use these patents to uh license them out so generate some profit from from kind of like uh, getting some royalty uh but that's how it kind of creates values for the company. And this is very different from how usually a, a university researcher will think about this because for them, it's usually about the merit system is about publishing. It's about openly sharing your data, openly showing what kind of results you have, uh, advancing knowledge in that way, uh, seeing science more of a common good. Uh, while while when, when it comes to companies in general, they will become more that it's not so much about a common good, but it's more of something that would create value for the company than um, creating value for others is through, well, basically a secondary thought, of course. It's interesting you uh, talk about that because my observation recently um, has been that many universities are actually now allowing a lot of their scientists to get patents and universities that are sharing it and the, the profits from uh, developing some of this basic research into uh, marketable uh, goods and ideas. So I don't know if you experienced any of that and maybe in Europe is different than the United States. Yeah, it depends on really what you, which country you look at. It's uh, um so, so so if you say three decades ago, I mean, then then usually publicly funded research would belong to basically the state. And and then this Bayh-Dole Act came, which basically says that in, in the US, it says, basically says that uh, publicly fund, I mean, findings from publicly funded research belongs to the university because it means that this would, uh, provide a university with more incentives to try to commercialize it. So, so basically, um, research should not only have a, a value for researchers, but also for society more directly, right? And and I mean, of course, that that's a big uh, change in um, let's say the view of how science, the impact of science, and and uh, now now of course I know that U.S. universities. Uh, especially we're talking about the, the big, uh, large and uh, excellent research university. They do have actually quite large uh, uh, offices that are working with trying to commercialize it. So it's a, and, and, and that's actually something that more 
universities across the world has followed. So, so this uh, by dole inspired acts or legislation that like were kind of the uh, IP stemming from research belongs to the university has been, for example, now also introduced, well, in Japan 20 years ago, in most countries in Europe, Sweden does not have that. Uh, so, yeah, but it, it's problematic because what 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 you researchers usually work with is, is fundamental research. It's, it's very early stage research. It's, it's difficult often to patent something, which of course you can patent things because if you have money, you will be able to patent because it's you just give it to a patent uh, attorney and you can just apply for a patent if there's money, but it doesn't mean that it, it, it's a useful or good patent. Uh, so, so researchers do not really focus on that. Universities might focus on that. Uh, uh, I would say maybe governments will focus on that more. But researchers, I think that unless it is a part of something you're being evaluated on, that will never be a, uh, a focus for researchers. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, you know, we have a major technical university here in Indiana, Purdue University. I know they have a big research park where their professors, you know, are actively engaged in commercializing uh, their research. So it, it's kind of an interesting change that's maybe occurred over the last several years. Yeah. So um, as we, we kind of, another issue, and maybe these are related, is there's been sort of a growing uh, skepticism about science in the last several years. You know, you know what are what are some of the causes of that? Maybe we already talked about that a little bit. And what can the scientific community do to really kind of bring back some of the credibility that uh, that they once had? Yeah, then it's it's a difficult question in the sense that I think uh, what we've seen. Yeah, I mean, a part of of what we've been describing that yes, commercialization of research. I think is increasing, and but 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 I think also the uh, expectations on what research could do or what it could solve in the short term I think also is often overstated. So what we have is uh, there's a lot of information about what research should be doing, and of course it's not always being pushed by scientists. Uh, you have politicians, and also we have. Uh, media we also have uh, people that are just uh, putting out disinformation on what this is and and this has obviously increased with uh, digitalization of course it's so much easier today to uh, just you know push out some theory about what this is about and it doesn't really need to be correct just some people will have a big platform to to say things, and and I think it the the, the issue here is there there are these platforms and there are more and more people that are willing to kind of like uh, be involved in this dialogue. Of course, I think dialogue is always part of a democratic society. But then, um, what scientists or, or or what I think the sector the the research sector should be doing is I think to be able to communicate better what science is about, uh, what, how the process looks like. So that, you know, so the thing with science is that it's often being, I would say, of course used, but mostly abused, I would say. Because the, the thing with science is that there are really no quick fixes. The, uh, the, the main motive of science is basically to advance knowledge. And then it can have some beneficial use, of course. But I, I think the expectations from society usually is that, you know, it should be quicker and it should be more direct, which is usually not. Uh, and, and, and with that also comes all this misrepresentations, misconstruing science and, and those kind of things. So, so it's, it's a process that I've seen increase over the years, also because of these platforms that we have. But also I think it, 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 it kind of goes along with how society is kind of developing and 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 I mean just if you look at the US polarization in politics is 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 rampant and 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 I think that that's also kind of 
uh, science is being kind of like brought along with that process also. Um, uh, so it's very difficult to say what to do about it. Like I said, it, I think the science community needs to be able to represent itself more accurately of what it is and what it's doing. But at the same time, there's a lot of, I think, fact resistance in uh, society today, which is very, very difficult to deal with also. Even if you push out that information, it, it's always someone louder and, and more vocal. Mm. And one area we didn't mention yet, uh, which is kind of a, a kind of on the in the media a lot nowadays, is the whole idea of AI, and uh, you know how how are countries dealing with you know, managing AI across borders, and and is this something that um, you know the scientific community is trying to address, as far as you know, trying to address not doing a very good job, I would say. Um, AI legislation is extremely difficult. Uh, and because it's it's often, the, the problem with AI is that I, it goes across borders, the use of it, and also um, the commercialization. Uh, but legislation is kind of nested within a country or region. Uh, so for in, actually for AI legislation to really have effect, it needs to it's, it needs to be a level playing field, which is it's, it's not right because legislation is often national, while research AI research AI use is across borders, and the development is happening so fast, it's very very difficult for legislation to catch up with. Uh, what is happening? Uh, so, so of course, big companies, big IT companies, and uh, uh, Google, and Microsoft, and uh, Baidu in China. Of course, they have a very big role in this, but they're also competitors. So, so no one wants to stop development because then means that someone else will kind of move ahead instead. That that's a problem today. So, it's, it's it's a very tricky question. What's tricky issue? What's going to happen? Legislation is definitely needed, but but there are definitely a lot of issues there. It's difficult to do it in a good way. Yeah, as, as you were talking about that, I was thinking about that whole issue of moral hazard, you know, coming up with better and better AI. Uh, what you know, what is the impact of that? And can we anticipate how how it might affect society? Hmm. I had always had this question: what happens the day that AI says don't call me artificial anymore so anyhow <laughs> so um in in your kind of opinion here are you optimistic about the future of, of the scientific community in terms of its ability to kind of resist domestic pressures to uh, restrain sharing of data and so forth and information across borders you know or, or in order to solve some of these problems or are you pessimistic um yeah yeah it, it's that one is very that's a very tricky i would say question it's it's it, yes yes and no i would say it's uh <laughs> uh i mean if you if you if you look at the at universities and uh for the past thousand years uh i mean they've been there it's universities are very stable organization you know been, been survived a lot of time periods and and uh, wars and and all those kind of things. So so I think it's a very resilient organization. Uh, but what we're seeing now, for the past couple of years, is just the the impact of global challenges is just increasing. And we talked about climate change. Things are happening so fast, and it's getting worse so quickly. You know, and how are we gonna deal with that? And 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 of course a lot of it has to do with how, how politicians will want to deal with it, but also how companies want to deal with it. And, and, and scientists and science here is, of course, big part of this equation because scientists will be able to advance knowledge to propose solutions and co-create co solutions with policymakers and uh, with companies. Um, so, 
uh, there is a path forward, of course, uh, but but like I said in the beginning, it's moving, of course, towards more restrictions, more security concerns, less openness. So the way of co-creating, of co-creation is, is becoming much, much more difficult. Uh, so I, I in, in that sense, in the short term, I would definitely say that it doesn't look bright. It's going to be more difficult. And when we start to restrict the flow of information, the flow of data, the flow of knowledge, the knowledge flows basically, that's it's going to reduce the, the speed of how new knowledge is disseminated and created. That's just how things are. Uh, so, so there's a balance here. I mean, how, 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 how important is it to solve this and how much security do we need within, mm -hmm. you know, within a country, you know, and, and that's something that's going on right now. It's very difficult to, to, to know how this is going to end. How do the, how are the European countries dealing with this? I mean, they in a sense we don't as Americans, you know, we don't we think of them as states, but they're not. They're indiv independent countries, and so uh, do they have some competition and challenges across borders in in European Union? Yeah, I think the biggest problem in Europe is that uh, it's basically twenty seven countries. I mean, like the European Union, uh, a common market. Um, harmonization of laws, but 27 independent sovereign countries that are big or small, uh, are advanced, are middle income countries or high income countries, uh, have different political systems, con uh, different languages, cultures. Uh, so, of course, uh, if we look at it from that perspective, it's very difficult to somehow, even if you think that it might be difficult to uh, coordinate states, uh, coordinating countries that are so different is even more difficult. And how Europe is dealing with this is, I, I think there's a lot of uh, ambition. The ambition from the European Union basically is, is, is to now point with a whole hand and say, this is what you need to do. This is what you should be doing. Instead of you know having this open discussion, I think it's going a little more towards you know trying to show with the whole hand that this is the direction you need to go and this is these are the changes you need to make. But uh, it's very difficult when it all these countries you know still sovereign, right? It's it's very difficult to have an impact even if you show it with a whole hand. There's not a lot of tools that you have to make them comply sometimes. And you don't want to comply either, but I want them to comply because it, it's not a dictatorship. Hmm. Interesting. And you you've worked with the European Commission, so you know what do they have like some mechanisms they're putting in place to try and address this? Yeah, often it's 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 kind of have this span of everything from the more soft tools to legislation, right? I mean, it's it's very difficult to legislate about everything. Uh, so, so obviously it's going to be that the, the commission will try to use these more soft tools. Um, so, so a lot of it is, is trying to be inclusive to have, um, of course, all the countries represented from, from big to small. And, uh, and then it's always going to be that France, uh, Germany, of course, will, will have more to say because they're bigger countries and, and, and stronger, like economically. Um, but but I, I think that uh, it, it, it has to be a very, very inclusive way of uh, acting and, uh, and then trying to come to some consensus that this is what we should be doing. And, and from there, show that, well, look at all these country representatives from the member states have said that we need to go into this direction. So now you just need to find ways of doing it. That's kind of like the, the way it's uh, usually being done. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so I, I think at this point, we'll kind of switch over and uh, take some questions from our, from our audience. Uh, again, if you have a question, if you just send it to me in the chat, and then I'll uh, uh, ask it. So we have a question from Larry Chimino, and then uh, Claire Collins, 
and then uh, Charlie and Carrie Boswell. So we'll start with Larry. Larry, you want to go ahead? Thank you, Ray, and uh, thank you for staying up so late to talk to us uh, this evening. Uh, I was wondering what economic opportunities you might have seen arising from international data sh sharing that allow scientists in um, developing countries to participate in providing answers and or solutions to some of the business problems from the, the developing world. And as an example, the pharmaceutical company I worked for created a group that would take problems we were having in research or development or manufacturing processes, post them with a, uh, with a bounty, if you would, and then people throughout the world could sign up to participate in this. If they solved the problem, they got, they got paid for it. And as an interesting anecdote, when our CEO was at a at a uh, pharma conference with uh, CEOs from other companies, one of them came up to me and said, "Some of our scientists are spending the time we're paying them to solve your problems." And so, but you know, in terms of creating opportunities for uh, for uh, for scientists in other countries, are you, are you seeing much of that happening yet? And is that uh, something that you think is a good thing? Uh, I mean, when it comes to science, I, I think the underlying problem here that science is is unfortunately not something very uh, equitable. It's uh, <laughs> I, I, if talking about science, we often need to have it's, it's need to have really high level training, need to have resources and instrumentation. Uh, I, I think the problem here is that the best scientists or with the resource, they will actually move to um countries with more resources and then that that and 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 then the resources even if they're good researchers back over in in less developed countries you know they they're under resourced they uh, uh often need to i mean as a scientist you probably also let's say that you're a medical scientist you you would probably also work at the local hospital you know helping out with uh, um just simple things such as uh, blood tests and 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 uh, and those kind of things uh, so 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 I, I i think that i do see a lot of companies western companies trying to do the right thing but 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 maybe not always that understanding of the uh, uh the environments and and how under resourced they are and then and and that actually if they they want to contribute or, or compete on the same level you know you just kind of raise these resources up to this level in order for them to be able to to kind of compete on the same level and and that's a difficult thing um i mean i, I do see uh from the european union for example and companies in the european union a, a lot of good attempts at trying to create this uh, these more equitable partnerships and relationships but but it, it, it's just very very difficult especially in africa where we also have this problem with Africa is interesting because if, if you look at uh, which countries in the um, in Africa are, are dictatorships and which are democracies and it's basically half half and and then it can take go a few years and they will just switch around so if you don't have that stability there either it is also very difficult to create that longevity and 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 actually the the foundation to to actually be able to to get to a higher level. Uh, the thing that's going on in Africa right now, for example, is there's a lot of young people, and and that that's and 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 the level of education, the education levels are rising. So so that's a good thing, you know. So maybe let's say in twenty years, if we would follow like a linear line there, then of course that would be the next engine of growth, right? But with the situation as it looks like right now, and with climate change, and and these people around the equator will be mostly affected by climate change. I just don't know how the conditions for competing on the same level is just not there. And I'm not sure it will be there in, even in 20 years. So- Thank you. Larry, did you have a second question there or would you? Well, I, I did have another question and that has to do with uh, whether global sharing creates opportunities for major data breaches or for bad actors to steal data from uh, for the purpose of uh, infringing patents and so forth. You've talked about this a little bit, but uh, what are your thoughts there in terms of the, the negative uh, uh, consequences of, uh, of data sharing in this way? Yeah, um, I, I think that open science is, is a uh, good idea, but then 
yeah, we, we do we do have certain states that somehow have industrial policies that uh, kind of almost venture into what would be um, espionage sometimes, yes. So we do really have that. Uh, but but I, I would say that it, it's a subset of all, all this sharing kind of like that, that kind of will be bothered by this. So it's just not the, across the board. So I think the solution should definitely not be that we should just protect everything. Just it has to be a lot more granular. Right. Thank you. Uh, Claire, you, you had a question? Um, yeah, I um, I read the article and I was concerned about the global warming. Um, it made me think of a book I read a few years ago called The Brothers Vonnegut. Uh, it was a dual biography about two guys from Indiana. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, of course, became a novelist, but his older brother Bernard was a chemist for GE um, in the late 40s to about 1952, I think. Um, and he did some experiments on cloud seeding, which some of it was successful and some wasn't, and some was a little too successful. Um, I guess one person's success is another's misfortune, but um, he he left the company then. But um, I I was it the uh, chemist the chemist. Um, the uh, element or uh, whatever was uh, that he was using was silver iodide. And um, so I, I looked it up on Wikipedia a few days ago um, to refresh my memory, but it's been used uh, more recently. Um, it was used during the Vietnam War to extend the monsoon season uh, 30 to 45 days and make the supply chain of the Viet Cong um, more difficult in the mud, um, but it's been used in Europe um, and the Middle East recently and Australia um, to make rain, but um, it's pretty scary if you can affect um, another country's um, ecology and, and climate. And I just wondered, are there any um, international bureaucracies that would prevent disasters? Uh, th this is, yeah, th these kind of things are usually not regulated, um, especially when we're talking about research. Um, th 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 these are issues for uh, ethical review boards, usually. And, uh, but, but they will they have this in their portfolio, they will basically say whether or not this research is ethical or not. And, um, and but, but uh, if there's no legislation backing that up, and which we will not, we will not see, uh, international law is not very good at uh, coordinating things like this. Um, I, uh, you kind of probably have to, we have to leave it to the ethical review boards and, and, uh, this needs to be a considerable amount of training to kind of understand how we should think about these things. Uh, at this moment, I don't see a lot. Uh, it, it's very difficult to legislate across borders. Uh, and uh, so, so, so the uh, so so basically, let's say the 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 line of defense that we have is ethical review, peer review. That that's what we have in science. Are they working with the United Nations? Do, um, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out where they would all come together. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, that that could be an option. Yeah, uh, UNESCO, for example, um, that uh, that ha that has been uh, the United Nations. Sometimes will be more of a well, a, a place to gather. Definitely important is, but. It's, especially around these issues and uh, the results and the findings of what they come up with might not be, let's say that potent always. Uh, but I, I think it's definitely needed. Uh, a platform is needed. I work with a global research council, uh, which is basically a uh, uh, consortium of 
public research funders from across the world. And they would be very capable of bringing up this question because funders, they have a stake in this. And then of course, you know, if you provide, if you give up funding, if you're the one that funds things, then of course you have a lot to say. So that could also be another option. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Charlie and Kerry, did you uh, have a question? Yeah, is the world scientific community starting to express concern over the upcoming US presidential election since one of our major candidates has a pretty demonstrable record of being anti-science and certainly anti-international cooperation? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I think uh, definitely in, in Europe, I think basically everyone I talk to is, is very concerned and, and, and it, it's difficult to understand, of course, seeing it from the outside for, I mean, seeing it from the outside, it seems kind of obvious that this is not a very good candidate, but, uh, uh, but, but, but then, you know, it, it seems like, uh, this person has a lot of support, you know, from, from a very big base. And, uh, uh, so, so th definitely now what in Europe, what we're concerned about, for example, is, uh, I mean, very talking about NATO uh, just in the beginning, and uh, because what could happen there is if the U.S. pulls out of NATO, and if that, if that even that would be possible, and and, and uh, some somehow I think that uh, e even if if the U.S. will not pull out of NATO, I I, th I think that with uh, Donald Trump as a president, that that would still kind of mean. Uh, something for NATO and and its effectiveness, uh, but but what would happen basically is that uh, then uh, Putin Vladimir Putin will you know be able to kind of expand and 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 probably uh, prolong this war and 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 maybe even win the war, which is going to be extremely problematic for Europe, which is then going to lead to more isolation in Europe because then obviously. Uh, it's can't really talk about having a transatlantic pact anymore if that would happen. Uh, and, and this will not benefit anyone in the world except for Vladimir Putin and Russia. Uh, so 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 we're very concerned in Europe and, and, and trying to, of course, there's a lot of ideas of thinking about what should be the contingency plan here, you know, and, and, and unfortunately it goes more towards uh you're building walls you know european sovereignty you know every european autonomy you know we we need to be able to rely on ourselves which would make us less capable or anyone less capable of, of dealing with global problems okay thank you charlie and carrie um so i had this kind of brought up uh, another question for me uh, in terms of scientists who do defense research versus scientists who are doing more other, I guess, non-defense research, maybe is a way to think about it. You know, are the these different communities or are these the same people that are just uh, kind of focused on different issues and do they talk to each other? Uh well, it's very difficult to draw a clear line there. I, I would say the easiest way of drawing a clear line would be the... Um, for example, NATO has this uh, defense fund, and that's that that's definitely you know for dual use research. Uh, so if, if you're in in those programs, of course you're going to be limited in in how you can share your data, who you can work with. Foremost, of course, it will be only with allied partners. Uh, then we have this problem with, I mean, let's say in engineering. Uh, so, so the distinction sometimes, jokingly, what people do is we'll talk about uh, research that is dual use and research uh, that is not yet dual use. That's what people talk about. It, it, it's just kind of like everything in the engineering can be used for uh, military purposes if you have enough imagination. Um, so it's very difficult to draw a clear line there where where it goes, right? But but I I would say that uh, 
uh, if you draw the line, the 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 obvious or the obvious lines where it's being funded for military research, yeah, then there's no sharing. But then if you go to a more gray area, yeah, that that's that's still usual regular, uh, I would say scientific exchange processes going on there. Hmm. Okay. Um, I think Hannah Voss has a question. Yes, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a question about kind of more about climate change and climate change mitigation. I'm wondering if there's a specific country, maybe in Europe, if that's what you're most familiar with, um, that is excelling at addressing climate change. I know a lot of countries like to talk about it, although in the US sometimes there's still hesitation about addressing it and what can be done to address it. But is there a country that you think that is actually doing really good work um, in addressing climate change? Thank you. Uh, I, doing, doing really well. I, I Well, I, I wouldn't say that there's any country that's doing really well. Uh, it's, uh, if you look at the rankings, usually Sweden would be on top of the list, the Nordic countries. And uh, but but I, I would still say that we in Sweden have a long way to go. Uh, but if we talk about the um, use of uh, clean tech, use of green technologies, definitely, you know, China and the US actually would be on top of the list here. Uh, but but then, you know, that that's also the problems with the US and China is that uh, still a lot of coal being burned, uh, a lot of fossil fuels being used. So, so, so it, it doesn't really kind of balance out. While while Sweden has more of a Sweden is a very small country also, as as more I think across the board, a a better way of approaching it. Uh, everything from the energy mix, you know, less of burning coal and and more of renewables like. Uh, uh, but but it also goes comes to kind of simple things as uh, consumption behaviors, um, you know, and 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 what kind of vehicles, or if you want to, or if you take uh, public communications and and those kind of things. That that that's just people ride a bicycle, in but but that that's almost impossible, you know, in the U.S. Sometimes you know uh, to. <laughs> Right, T take your bicycle to work and um, and and those kind of things, right? But 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 you know, it really has to be on a system level. You know, it has to be across the board. And 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 here, I really see, of course, Northern European countries being um, a little better. Uh, and and uh, so so the issue here is not really just going to be solved by, well, let, let, let's just kind of like put in more te new technology and and things will get solved. You know, because it, it, pe people's mindsets will not change, you know, then there will be no real change. Yes, yeah, kind of a follow up to that. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, follow up to that. Uh, I've heard politicians in the United States use the phrase that, you know, we should let the market decide, you know, what kind of technologies uh, are in place. And, you know, there's a lot of objection right now to this whole issue about gas stoves. I don't know if that's an issue in, in Sweden or not, but that has become kind of a a uh, political what's the phrase we use in the United States political football you know, that, you know that somehow or other we're forcing people to get rid of their gas stoves for electric and so this, this becomes sort of a a, uh, a crazy situation where what's being said isn't actually true but uh, it's used to kind of thwart the implementation of technologies. Mm. So. Anyhow, just a comment. Betty, I think Betty had a question. Thanks, Ray. Uh, actually, it's a couple of questions, Tommy. Um, and I want to bring it down to just the consumer level, um, which is where most of us live. And one is associated with addressing um, the, um, the understandably nervous reaction of people regarding new vaccinations. We're still going through this with COVID. I mean, we're talking about COVID like it was something that happened so long ago. And it really was just two years ago, we were still kind of just coming out of 
the throes. It hasn't been that long ago. And it, it still sears in my mind the, the, the concern and people who are not scientists talking as though they, their, their views should be deeply respected that, well, after all, it took decades to get vaccinations in the past. We can't possibly trust something. So, and I have a second question after you ask this, after you address this one. For those of us who would, who get frustrated with that, I want people to kind of stop talking to their friends who aren't scientists. <laughs> that this may be something, I don't know how a car drives either, but I get in a car every day and drive it. Um, com you know, comfortable in the knowledge that people put it together who knew what they were doing or get on an airplane or I eat meat, comfortable in knowing that people knew what they were doing and putting it together. What can we what can we say to people who are just don't trust science to the point that they're not going to trust the um, because of the rapidity of the COVID vaccinations and just the vaccinations in general, again, here in the U.S., this distrust has now lent itself to schools. We have a, a surgeon general in the, in the state of Florida. He, he, this is a wackadoodle case, I think, but he's is telling parents, if you don't want your child to be vaccinated against measles, and they're having an onslaught of measles in Florida, and even say, and you will let, we'll trust you if you want to send your child to school. And people are just responding. A part of us, the political climate we live in currently. Well, what can we say to people in conversations that we have, at parties and at dinner gatherings, just among consumers, kind of welch this craziness? It's I see it as crazy. So I guess my view is is being expressed. But what what can we as consumers? How can we best address this? We're not scientists. We don't want to sound like a scientist. I don't want to sound like a scientist. But what can we say, Tommy? What might you suggest? The people who are saying this aren't scientists either. They don't build cars, yet they drive a car. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's very difficult to convince people if, if because a lot of times, you know, I some of these ideas are, are definitely not based on facts. It's it's not based on a clear logic. And I mean, and, and also the thing with science is that science is, is usually not exact. Um, it, it, it's about developing hypotheses, testing them and seeing whether they're accurate or not, but, but it, it's under certain circumstances, right? So we, we believe it will work, you know, given this range of parameters. Uh, but 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 with immunization, with vaccination, what we what we know is that basically the data is pointing in one direction. It's the same with climate research; it's pointing in one direction. It, it's very difficult to say that uh, climate change is a hoax. It, it's not. I mean, because even if scientists disagree, they would still agree on the overall ninety nine over ninety nine percent agree on the direction. It's the same with immunization. So that's the fact. But then how are you going to convince? Maybe that, I don't know if that's a... It's not so much that the, the immunization works. I think the concern is that they were saying, oh, it couldn't possibly. I mean, it took it takes a long time to develop an effective. And how could you do it in such a short period of time where in the past it took a long time to really... And that's the concern. I think people don't trust the process. It was too fast. Yeah, and, and you spend twenty or thirty years or something, then they feel yeah, okay. Yeah, but uh, but the thing with with the COVID vaccine that it it, it has been kind of if you look at um, uh, the research on on the vaccine eff efficacy, it's been proven. You know, so so it 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 it's kind of like been scientifically proven. Uh, I mean, depending on which vaccine we're talking about, uh, but. Uh, uh, but 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 it's kind of kind of like that's the fact we have these facts and 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 they're kind of like predominantly showing that this is how it looks like. And of course, there will be uh, some disagreement, uh, maybe of the vac mechanisms or or uh, how it could be improved or yeah, and 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 the, the level of efficacy might might shift, you know. But it, it has a certain level of effectiveness. 
then th so the issue for me is really not about what science shows what what in these areas it's, it's more about so the communication here maybe that's not a scientific issue yeah i think i think what i'm going to do is just pull my my car example and say we well, get in a car you didn't build because <laughs> that really is it's really is hard it's it's going to be a value judgment people have to make well, let's talk national security um what are the national security concerns, particularly in dealing with uh, countries we are uncomfortable with, such as Russia and China? Um, when we do the collaborations, um, I have deep respect for um, um, Russian education. It's when we lived in Kyrgyzstan, I was very concerned about this in Central Asia. I was very concerned about what kind of a doctor we should go and see because I heard that the medical schools in Central Asia students <laughs> tended to buy their way through to get their degrees. And I said, well, what kind of doctor should we look for in case we need one? We won't be using the embassy's doctors. Um, and we were told to find an older doctor that had been trained in a Russian university uh, who had gotten good science education and would be good. Just don't get one went to a local school. And we were fine. Um, but what are the national security concerns? Is this real or not? Can we do collaboration with labs in China and in Russia, if we are, and, uh, and not just for the US, but for Europe. And can we do that um, with scientists, knowing that they should be above um, politics, but there is national security concerns perhaps. Can you address that or not? There will always be risks associated with uh, scientific changes. And I, I guess it's a question about uh, risk appetite. Of course, people should not stupidly take on risk just because you know they they, they are not that risk averse. Uh, if you talk about the national security risk, I, I think that the problem that I have with that is that it's often so vaguely described that uh, you know th those events, that we've been talked that, that we often hear about well, it could be spies it could be uh, uh espionage in some other form uh cybersecurity problems yeah yeah they they it, it, they those problems might be real yes and uh, uh and they do occur but it's very seldom maybe cybersecurity obviously is is something much more uh, frequently occurring than than having a spy planted somewhere uh, but uh, but they they happen. But but does it mean that we should close down the whole system? That's my question here. Um, so I was I was responded earlier talking about I think we need to have a little more granularity, understanding first what it is, but then also then what it affects, because we don't want to, uh, you know, just just because you have a little hole in your tooth, you know, you don't want to pull out the whole tooth, right? So, so proportion proportionality is extremely important here. You just want to, you know, be so harsh that you will, will kind of destroy everything, you know, good with science. So it's about finding the balance here. I, I think the risks are real to some extent, but it's not worth it to kind of like erode a whole system, destroy a whole system just because some concerns, but but these concerns, of course, it's uh, when they happen, they're also severe. So so it's, it's it's also not that easy to just say that well, there's there's so few of these cases, and uh, but if they happen, they are usually severe. So we need to deal with them. But what what's the right approach here? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Betty. Um, I think we're actually kind of out of questions here right now from the audience. So, uh, and I know it's very late for you, Tommy. We really do appreciate you uh, staying up late. Uh, for those of you who might've missed it at the beginning, it's uh, closing on 1.30 in the morning in, uh, in Sweden. I think it's awake, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, we really do appreciate it. And uh, Betty, if you want to take us home. Yeah, well, thank you, Tommy, very much. I think, um, We've learned a lot tonight and about an issue that many of us probably didn't pay an awful lot of attention to prior to COVID, 
And uh, let me ask you uh, just very quickly, has in this country, um, public health also wasn't an issue that was discussed much. I think it was probably taken for granted here in the United States. Um, when you think that public health are things such as water and things, all things related to water from what we drink to indoor plumbing. Uh, we're living about 30 years longer now than we were in 1901, and about 25 of those years could be directly attributed to public health. It's just water and immunizations. And what's interesting is that at the university, while here in this country, enrollments are down overall in universities, there's many factors for that, including the cost of college tuition, and is this degree worth it? But enrollments for schools of public health have significantly increased and are you experiencing that also in uh, Sweden? Uh, in, in Sweden, basically, we, the, the universities are, are, are predominantly publicly funded. Um, that's, oh, that's true. Yes. And, uh, yes. Uh, uh, and, and I would say donations and uh, philanthropy is really a small, only a small part of uh, but but definitely we, we we of course there has been um, a little yeah the, the budget allocation looks different of course in in times such as these. Well, has there been an increase in public health among students in Sweden aside from the cost of tuition, just uh, as opposed as a result perhaps of COVID? Uh, the young people paying attention, being home from school, paying attention. This is something new. And it's just, it really, schools of public health across the country are enjoying interesting and significant increases in enrollment in public health because the demand among students is there. Yeah. And we've yeah, seen this no, growth I, since COVID. Yeah, no, I, anecdotally, yeah, I I, I would say so. And, and, and maybe not so kind of like so much the, um, uh, the physical health of students, but maybe the mental health, I, I probably kind of, sense a change you know students i don't know if that has to do with uh kind of like it, it's more accepted in society today to to talk openly about mental issues and uh, those kind of things um but but I, I definitely see a lot more students getting burned out and um being you know, what I'm tell me what i'm talking about is an interest in public health as a course of study to go into the field of public health as opposed to uh, the, the other uh, uh, universities are, are declining in enrollment. And aside from the tuition, which we're not comparing apples to apples here, but that the interest has increased significantly for students to study public health. Have you seen that in Sweden? Uh, no, I mean, I mean it, it's, uh, I, I haven't seen the enrollment numbers. I, I, so I don't know how many are applying. Uh, so I and 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 the uh, let's say the uh, the spots uh, for a certain, any specific health program I don't have I don't think they have increased so I don't really see that uh, Sw Swedish university is very bureaucratic they they kind of it takes ages to change something in the core structures and 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 the uh, <laughs> so, so it, it doesn't it doesn't happen it can, it cannot uh, that's what I was talking about earlier also about the uh, resilience of universities universities are extremely resilient, especially those that are publicly funded. Yeah, publicly funded, but bureaucratic. <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes, I, I can't, I can't speak to whether they're, I know they're bureaucratic here, but as far as whether they're change adverse, I don't know. I can't speak to that. Um, however, thank you very much. This has been very informative. And I know we're going to be continuing this soon, two weeks, when we talk about pandemic preparedness. Clearly, science and public health is going to be a part of. We seem to have had common thread with our with our um, topics this year in Great Decisions. It's been rather interesting. Um, so, and and science has clearly been one of those um, has been one of those threads. It's been really fascinating. Again, I want to remind you that our our topics are given to us by the Foreign Policy Association. So a great deal of thought is put into these and and uh, they must be thinking about common threads when they do put them together. But thank you, Tommy, very much. And uh, again, for, for agreeing to see us so late at night. 
and, and for joining us. And thank you to this wonderful audience for your questions. Again, a reminder that next week, uh, it's going to be on Wednesday at 1130. So if you sign up, and, and that is going to be a program that Hana, who's on still with us this evening, head of us, has been working on and found a wonderful speaker for that. And then uh, two weeks from um, um, uh, tonight, on a Tuesday night, will be NATO, um, the future NATO. I think you want to join us and participate in that conversation. And then uh, our very last program on the 26th of March will be pandemic preparedness with the uh, retired, with the not retired, but he was the Surgeon General for the United States and the Trump administration, he is now at Purdue University. So thank you all for joining us and I wanna wish you all a good night. Thank you, Ray, for the questions. Good night all.